Chapter 6 The Christmas tree lighting in the town square was beautiful. Ricky was surprised how well she handled the crowd as long as she was close to Ben. She held his gloved hand the whole time, and she felt perfectly safe. He left her once to get hot chocolate for both of them, and she found herself growing increasingly nervous until he came back to her and handed her the styrofoam cup he'd purchased for her. You were starting to panic, weren't you? She nodded. As soon as you left, I started looking around me, trying to figure out which man would put me in his car and drive off. I'm like one of those soldiers with PTSD, and you're like the dog who calms me. She hid a smile behind her cup as she took a sip. I don't know how I feel about being compared to a therapy dog. At least I'm not comparing you to one of those dogs who runs around with a barrel of whiskey tied to his neck. A St. Bernard? You cannot be comparing me to a St. Bernard now. I feel so abused. Oh, hush. I'll kiss you all better later. Ben grinned at her. Don't say that too loud. It sounded a lot naughtier than I think you meant it. Ricky felt the heat rising in her cheeks. She hadn't meant anything dirty by her words, but she could see where he'd gotten that. Be nice. Let's go see what the vendors are selling. They walked toward the row of vendors selling their Christmas wares. There were booths selling Christmas dolls, tree ornaments, wreaths, and dozens of other Christmas items. It was fun to walk through and see what was there. By the time they'd walked the length of the row, Ricky had purchased several different things for her family and friends. She found the perfect ornament for Valerie, a pregnant woman. For her mother, she found an ornament proclaiming that she was a grandmother, and got the same thing for Linda. There were a lot of babies that would soon be coming into her world, and she loved it. Finally, after spending several hours walking around the square, talking to the different people they both knew and shopping, Ben said, I should get you home. We have a big day tomorrow. I'm probably going to miss service. Grace said she and Marcus would drive us to the airport. I can't miss, but if you three would pick me up at the church, I'll have my suitcase in my car. We'll take off as soon as the sermon is over. You can't miss? Ever? Well, sometimes I can, but I'm giving my first sermon here tomorrow. Brother Anthony said that the church needs fresh blood, and it might as well be mine. Ricky laughed. That sounds like Brother Anthony. She thought for a moment about the time. I can come. It'll be tight, but if you can make it, then I can too. I'd like you to be there for my first sermon here. That's all you had to say. Of course, I'll be there. On the drive back to the Culpeper Ranch, he peppered her with questions about her sister and Jesse. They seem to be really in love. How long have they known each other? They met when they auditioned for the show. This is their fifth season, so it's been close to five years? I think? And it took them that long to marry? You said he was in love with her from day one. He was, and I think she was in love with him. She was dating Curtis, though, and he was controlling. He did everything he could to keep them apart. It was the first time she'd said Curtis's name to him when she hadn't seemed to be overcome with fear. He'd take that as a win. And you said she broke it off with him and married Jesse the same day? Yeah, Jesse talked her into flying to Vegas with him to marry. Mom and I didn't even know till the next day. She shook her head. It's amazing how perfect they are together. I'm glad they finally figured it out. When did they marry? In March. She got pregnant almost immediately, which is great. I get to have a little nephew. They had to marry them in the show really quick to cover the pregnancy, but neither of them complained. And we're also going to meet others from the show? Well, I'm not sure, but I think we'll see Amber and probably Bob. You've met Bob, though, right? Bob Bodefeld? Yeah, I met him in May at church. I like May a lot. She's really awesome. Did you know she's a romance writer? Ricky asked. 
She'd been reading May's novels for a lot longer than she'd known the woman's real name. Really? Yeah, but she uses a pen name, so you'd never know unless she told you. She lives less than a mile from the set. Hopefully we'll get to stay with them. You don't want to stay with your sister and Jesse? They live in a trailer on the set. It would be strange. I can see that. He pulled into Linda's driveway and got out of the car, walking around to open her door. So, I guess I'll see you at church tomorrow. With your suitcase. I'm glad you agreed to go with me. I'm excited to see Valerie. She was even more excited for Valerie and Jesse to get to know him, though. She couldn't wait. He pressed a quick kiss to her lips and waiting until she went inside before turning back to his car. He planned to come home engaged to Ricky, no matter what it took. Asterisk. Ricky sat toward the middle of the church for Ben's sermon the following morning. It was the first time she hadn't sat in the very back row, ready for a quick escape. It felt odd to be so close to the front, but the first time his eyes met hers during the service, she felt comfortable. There were people on either side of her, but she knew them, and that made it easier. Little Corinne sat on her right side, and as soon as the sermon was over, she stood up and did a little spin. She was wearing her tutu and butterfly wings over her pants and blouse, which made Ricky smile. How does she sleep in her butterfly wings? She asked Patience. Patience shook her head. I finally got her to where she'll take them off, to take a bath, and to sleep. She even wears them to school. When you marry Pastor Benjamin, I'm going to spin down the aisle with the flowers, okay? Corinne asked. Ricky blinked a couple of times. What? When you ask me to be your flower girl, I'm going to spin instead of walking. I have my own flower girl style, and I've done it before, so you just need to smile and let me do my thing, okay? This will be my fourth wedding. I, what? Patience patted Ricky's arm. The whole town has been planning your wedding for almost a week. Get used to it. That's just how Culpepper is. Ricky sighed. That's great. My wedding is being planned without me. She got to her feet and nodded at Ben, who was hurrying toward the back of the church. She'd ridden into church with Marcus and Grace, so her suitcase was already in the back of Marcus's truck. She met up with Ben at the back of the church, smiling shyly. Your sermon was wonderful. I was a little surprised by the topic, but I enjoyed it. Brother Anthony chose my topic. As a single pastor, I had no desire to preach on abstinence until marriage, but there was no choice. At all. You seemed a little uncomfortable with the topic, but it was still good. Yeah. Well, I made it work. Are you ready? She nodded. Let's get out of here. Grace walked over and linked her arm through Ricky's. Marcus sent me in to get you too. We have to leave now unless you want to miss your flight. Marcus is being overdramatic, Ricky said. We have three hours before our flight. An hour to get to the airport and two hours to wait for our flight. We'll be fine. Still, they hurried out to the truck and climbed in, buckling immediately. Ricky felt odd to be taking a trip with Ben, but she was excited as well. She couldn't wait until she could see just how round her sister had gotten. She and Valerie were both tiny women, and the last time she'd seen her she'd looked like she'd swallowed a basketball with two full months to go. She should look very interesting by now. They got their boarding passes as soon as they got to the airport, and Ricky looked at hers and laughed. Valerie got us first class. She knew I'd have flown coach. Ben looked at his ticket. I've never flown first. Have you? Only when I was going somewhere with my sister. I thought she'd put us in coach if she wasn't with us. Two hours later they were on the plane. He stretched out his legs with a smile. I've never sat on an airplane that had enough room for my long legs. She shrugged. I fit pretty well into the coach seats, so I don't mind flying cheap. 
The stewardess came to get their pre-flight drink orders, and Ricky pulled out her phone to text Valerie and let her know they were on their way. A woman who was walking by stopped and stared at Ricky for a moment. You look almost exactly like that actress. Valerie Dobson. I'm her younger sister. Ricky thought for a moment about correcting the woman and telling her that her sister was Valerie Saboino, but she didn't. What difference did it make? Oh, so you're the one who got kidnapped. That must have been rough. Ricky simply smiled. It wasn't a walk in the park. Well, you tell your sister that we're all praying for her to have a healthy baby. I will. Thank you for caring about her so much. Oh, Lazy Love is the best show on television. We all just love Valerie. I think we were all more excited for their wedding than they were. Ricky turned to Ben as the woman walked away. I hate when people recognize me as looking like Valerie. I love my sister, but being linked to a kidnapping is not the way I want to be known for the rest of my life. You could be known as a pastor's wife, if you'd prefer. I know how to arrange it. One of these days, you're going to say something like that, and I'm going to agree, and you're not going to know how to react. He laughed. Yes, I will. I'll break into song. What song? Hallelujah. She smiled, pulling the pillow from the back of the seat in front of her, where she'd tucked it as soon as she'd gotten onto the plane. I'm not a good flyer, so I'm going to sleep the whole way. I hope you don't mind. Of course not. I brought my iPad, and I'm going to play with my puzzle app. Puzzle app? He held up the iPad. I got a jigsaw puzzle app. I love puzzles, but they take up too much room, and they're a pain to tuck away. With the app, I can do a whole puzzle quickly, and even if I don't, it'll be there waiting for me later. Okay, you play puzzle, and I'll sleep. She put the pillow against his shoulder, and rested her head on it. He smiled at her, wondering if she realized just how comfortable she'd become with him in a very short time. If only she'd take his proposal seriously. Asterisk. Jesse and Valerie were both waiting in baggage claim when they got to DFW airport. Ricky flew at her sister, hugging her tight. I've missed you. They'd grown a great deal closer since Valerie's marriage. Valerie kissed Ricky's cheek before turning her attention to Ben. It's good to see you again, Pastor Benjamin. Please just call me Ben. I don't want to be Pastor Benjamin to you. I want to be the man who's in love with your sister. Ricky stared at him. In love? Why else would I keep trying to convince you to marry me? Ben asked, shaking his head at her. He held his hand out to Jesse. Good to see you again. You too. Are you guys hungry? We can stop somewhere on the way to Wiggyville if you want. That sounds good, Ricky said. I think Ben ate on the plane, but I slept the whole time. His shoulder makes a good pillow. Jesse's does too. I always sleep on flights. Ricky studied Valerie for a moment. You're getting huge. Valerie laughed, resting her hand on the top of her belly. I feel very, very round. But I love being pregnant. I think we'll have a dozen kids. When Jesse didn't respond, Valerie poked him. Did you hear me? I said, I think we'll have a dozen kids. Jesse looked at Ben, ignoring his wife. So how did you two meet? Ben raised an eyebrow. He could tell Jesse was trying not to comment on the dozen kids thing. The same way I met you guys. In church. She was hiding in the back row, so I sat next to her. I've never seen her this happy. I didn't meet her until after the incident. The incident? Ricky asked. My kidnapping is now the incident? Did you tell him to call it that? She wished everyone would just quit pussyfooting around the whole thing and call a spade a spade. Calling it a diamond did no good. Valerie shook her head. He came up with it all on his own. 
See? He's not just another pretty face. Ricky laughed. And here I thought that head was totally empty. The luggage started coming out then, and the men paid close attention to the carousel. While they were watching, Ricky talked to Valerie. Where are we going to stay? She knew Valerie would have put anyone else up in the hotel in Wiggyville, but since that's where she'd been when Valerie had taken her place with Curtis, she wouldn't be there. You're going to stay with me, and Ben is going to stay with Bob and May. We thought he'd be more comfortable if you were staying in separate places. It wouldn't be good if it got back to the congregation that the two of you were staying together when you came here. Good point. Ricky sighed. So, tell me what you think of him. He's tall. Handsome. Seems to care about you a great deal. Are you going to marry him? Ricky shrugged. I honestly don't know. I'm a little worried that I'm falling for him too fast, if that makes any sense. I'm comfortable with him, and he makes me calm in a crowd. Did you notice I haven't had a panic attack since we got here? Valerie grinned. I didn't until you pointed it out. Good job. I know. Something about having him close is very calming. Sometimes. Only sometimes? Valerie asked with a frown. Well, sometimes he gets me all hot and bothered, Ricky whispered, blushing. She was embarrassed to talk about it, but if you couldn't talk about things like that with your pregnant sister, who could you talk about them with? Marry him. What? Just like that? You don't want to get to know him better? I think you're like me. Only one man in my whole life has ever made me feel anything sexual, and I married him. He's obviously the man God made just for you. Ricky frowned. You think? I do think so. Marry him. He'll make you happy. Ben walked over with their luggage, looking back and forth, between the two sisters. What are you two talking about? Sister stuff, Valerie responded before Ricky, could start sputtering. Let's stop and eat on the way back. I have a craving. Ricky groaned. Don't tell me. Tacos. Well, it is Sunday. Jesse rolled his eyes. She said the same thing yesterday, except Saturday. She's killing me. Well, at least Tex-Mex has other food. You could have a burrito. Or enchiladas. Or fajitas. Oh man, I need some Tex-Mex fajitas for this girl. Valerie linked her arm with Ricky's and led her toward the exit to the building. Tacos. I'm having tacos. Ben looked over at Jesse. Now I understand why Ricky was thrilled to have burgers and not tacos on our first date. Tacos used to be my favorite food, Jesse lamented. Now I'm so sick of them I don't even want to hear the word. But the baby needs them. Valerie protested. Tacos it is. Jesse looked at Ben and shook his head. I hope you like them, because we'll have them every day while you're here. I love tacos. I'll be Valerie's taco buddy. Good. Someone has to be. May's a good taco buddy. Valerie called over her shoulder. She works too much though. You only get tacos with her once or twice a week. Good point. Okay, you're my newly designated taco buddy, Valerie said to Ben. I hope you plan to take your duties seriously. Of course. I'm a serious kind of man after all. Ricky smiled to herself. Ben was getting along great with Valerie and Jesse. Maybe her sister was right, and she should marry him. Maybe. Chapter 7 The foursome stopped for dinner on the way to Wiggyville, and they all went to the set together. As soon as they arrived, Jesse called Bob and May to come over so they could get to know Ben a little before he went home with them for the night. When May walked in, Ricky hurried toward her and hugged her tight. It's good to see you. May smiled. There's so much of me to see right now. She patted her belly affectionately. 
I hope you too are taking belly-to-belly -belly pictures every month for a scrapbook. May laughed, looking at Valerie. We haven't really discussed the possibility, but I guess we could. Well, you need to do more than just eat tacos together. I second that. Bob said, waving at Ricky. He knew not to get too close. All the men she knew did. Ricky swallowed hard and walked over to Bob, hugging him. It's good to see you, Bob. Bob looked at her with surprise. You look happy. I'm glad. He patted her back awkwardly. Ben walked over and slid his arm around Ricky's waist, holding his hand out to Bob. I'm Ben. I'm the associate pastor of the church in Culpeper. We met the last time May and I were in town. We're not there every three weeks yet like Valerie and Jesse, but we'll get there. We're doing some renovations on the house we bought right now. Hopefully we'll be able to start living there part-time after Babette is born. Bob shrugged. I think it's going to be a good place for us to live. A small town with a real community like we portray in Lazy Love. It's a good place to live. Very community-focused, and the women are gorgeous. Ben was looking at Ricky as he said the last of it. Bob laughed. I can't argue with that. He looked over at Jesse. Why don't we show him the set? We can chat while we walk. Jesse nodded. We'll leave the girls alone for a few minutes. Have you ever been on a television set? Ben shook his head, intrigued. He was very interested to hear what the men wanted to talk to him about. Would you mind? he asked Ricky. She shook her head. Absolutely not. We came here for you to get to know everyone better. All right. I'll be back soon. As soon as they were gone, Ricky turned to May. Well? What do you think of him? May shrugged. He's no Bob. What really matters is what you think of him. Ricky took a deep breath, admitting aloud what she'd realized days before. I think I'm in love with him. Valerie clapped her hands, turning from where she was digging in the fridge. I knew it. Valerie, you sit and talk to May. You're too pregnant to be bending like that. What are you looking for? There's some taco meat in a Tupperware bowl from last night. Would you heat up the meat and make some nachos? I'm starving. Ricky blinked at her sister a few times. Are you kidding? We just ate. Baby Amber's hungry. May giggled. So is Bobette. I think it's been at least an hour since she's been fed. Ricky just shrugged, finding the taco meat. Do you want me to spread the meat over chips, add cheese, and bake it all in the oven? Sounds good. Valerie said encouragingly. Now, tell us more about Ben. Is he a native of Culpeper? Ricky talked while she worked. No, he hasn't been there as long as I have. He's very kind. He's taken over the church's Christmas pageant, and he's finding spots for all the kids, even the ones who have less than a thimbleful of talent. He's even creating a part for this little girl who can dance. Oh, you know Patience, Valerie. It's for her stepdaughter, Corinne. Oh, I think I've met Corinne. Isn't she the one who runs around in a tutu and butterfly wings all the time? May grinned. I've got to meet this kid. Ricky laughed. You really do. She's awesome. Anyway, she came up to me at church today and told me when I'm ready for her services she'll be spinning down the aisle. Her services? Valerie asked. She's some sort of professional flower girl. Probably only in her own mind, but she told me she's done four weddings, and she'd be happy to do ours. As long as we let her spin. Ricky shook her head. What do you even say to that? You're not engaged, are you? May asked, before looking at Valerie. You never tell me anything. I thought she was bringing the man she was dating here, and he's her fiancé? Ricky giggled, and Valerie looked over at her. 
you have no idea how good it is to hear you laughing again. I was so worried about you. Ricky slid the cookie sheet full of nachos into the oven before sitting at the table with her sister and May. I feel like I've just woken up from a deep sleep. I've been walking around in a fog for months, not letting myself feel anything, because I was worried I'd feel too much pain. It's like I was sleeping beauty, and it took Ben's kiss to wake me. How corny is that? May shrugged. I'm a romance writer. I love corny. We're not engaged. He's hinted that he wants to marry me, but we've only been dating a week. A whole week? Bob and I married six days after we met. What's the hold up? Maybe I'm not as crazy as you? Ricky made a face. Valerie laughed. That's my sister, coming back. I see the girl who yelled at me for being famous and ruining her life rearing her beautiful head. Ricky sighed. I'm sorry I did that. I was such a brat. You weren't. You just got tired of living in my shadow, and honestly, who could blame you? I love what I do, but I never really thought about how it would be for my almost identical kid sister. You didn't do anything wrong, Valerie. I was just a kid who thought her life was falling apart because her sister was famous. It was really stupid. Ricky shook her head. And it's my own fault I was kidnapped. I thought if I went with Curtis, I could get him to help me break you and Jesse up, and then Jesse would be free for me. You two were made to be together, and I was a stupid kid throwing a tantrum. Valerie covered Ricky's hand with hers. Oh no. You haven't been living with that guilt, have you? I promise you Curtis would have gotten you into that van either way. He was determined to do whatever he could to get me back, and he knew that I'd never let anything happen to you. Ricky swiped at a tear. I think I do know that, which makes it so much worse. I shouldn't have thought about breaking you up. I, I don't know that I'd have been able to do the same thing in your place. You're the strong sister. The good sister. What on earth am I doing dating a pastor? Valerie grinned. You're dating a pastor because you're a good person. You'll make a great pastor's wife. Think about it for a minute. Could someone who had never been through hardship be able to truly empathize with a person in pain? I think you'll be great in that role if that's what you choose. Do you really? May looked between the sisters, leaning forward. I probably shouldn't have been here for this whole thing, but I have to agree with Valerie. Ricky, you're an amazing young woman. You're strong and beautiful. You should do whatever is right for you, and let go of the guilt you feel for your own kidnapping. After all, you're the only one who was hurt. I put my sister in the role of having to risk her life for me. How can I forgive myself for that? Valerie leaned forward and kissed her sister's cheek. You can do it, because I don't think you did anything wrong. I understand. So, you have to forgive yourself, because truly, there's nothing to forgive. The timer on the stove buzzed, and Ricky jumped up to get the nachos, thinking about what Valerie had said. If she told the truth then, well, maybe she was good enough to marry Ben, after all. If he mentioned it again, she'd think about it. How could she not? He was a good man, and she loved him. She really did. When the men came back into the trailer, they saw what the women were eating, and Bob groaned. May, if Bobette is born with cheese for hair, I'm blaming no one but you. She needs tacos. How many times do I have to tell you that? May glared at her husband, making Ricky giggle. Ben walked around to stand behind Ricky, one hand going to her shoulder, possessively. The walk with the men had been very enlightening. He'd had no idea how protective her new brother-in-law and his best friend felt about her. They'd given him the be-careful speech, but then they'd also gone on to give advice about how to get her to marry him. He'd try it. He'd try anything at this point. In Culpepper time, they should have been married days ago. You're not having nachos? Ricky shook her head adamantly. 
I'm not even hungry. Dallary swore up and down little Amber would starve to death if she didn't feed him, so I made nachos for her and May. Bob groaned. You're not really calling that boy Amber. Jesse shook his head. No, we're not. Dallary calls him that just to annoy me, I think. Why would I do something just to annoy you? Dallary asked with an innocent look on her face. Because that's what you do. Why I thought I needed to marry you is beyond me. Because you can't imagine life without me. Dallary's voice was soft, but powerful. No one in the room had any doubt that she spoke the truth. Ricky looked over her shoulder at Ben, and that's when she realized that Jessie's truth was also hers. She couldn't imagine living the rest of her life without the man standing behind her. The next time he mentioned marriage to her, she was going to jump at the chance. How could she not when she loved him as much as she did? He was her oasis in the desert. Her port in a storm. Her, she almost groaned aloud at her constant maudlin thoughts. He was hers. What else mattered? Bob walked over behind May, resting his hands on both of her shoulders. When you two are done feeding the babies, we should get home. I know a certain writer who needs to get her word count in tonight, even if we do have guests. May shrugged. I actually got most of it in today. I only have another thousand words to go, and that's twenty minutes' work. Good. You and Bobette need rest. Ben frowned at Bob. Are you really naming that poor child Bobette? Bob shrugged. I think it has a nice ring to it. You don't like it? No, I really don't. May smiled. We'll call her Bobby. I think the world should be entirely peopled with Bobs. Sounds good to me. And I'll be King Bob. Court Jester Bob. Quit trying to elevate yourself to king status. May ate her last nacho and pushed away from the table. She looked over at Ben. Are you ready? Ben looked down at Ricky. He was ready all except for kissing his girl goodnight, but that would be strange in front of all these people. Ricky seemed to know what he was thinking, because she stood and raised her lips for his kiss. He pressed a light kiss to her mouth before walking toward the door. I'm ready. Just as his hand was about to reach the doorknob, Ricky called out, Hey, Ben? Yeah? Dream of me. Ben smiled, thinking of what he'd told her after their first kiss. How could I dream of anything else? Asterisk. Ricky woke early the following morning, even earlier than usual. She rolled out of bed and went to the bathroom to shower, before going into the kitchen. Jessie and Valerie weren't out yet, so she decided to make breakfast. After digging through the fridge, she found the makings for breakfast tacos, she knew it wasn't exactly what Valerie was craving, but the effort would make her happy. When Valerie came out a short while later, hiding a yawn behind her hand, she smiled. What are you doing up so early? You're never up early. I don't know. I woke up and realized I was in Texas with my sister and didn't want to waste a single minute of my time here. Valerie smiled. Something smells good. What are you making? Ricky carefully rolled up some of the eggs, sausage, and cheese mixture, put it on a plate, and handed it to her sister. Breakfast tacos. I know they're not exactly what you're craving, but I figured they'd make you happy. Of course, they do. Valerie walked to the table and took a huge bite, chewing slowly. Did you make any decisions? Ricky nodded. If he asks again, I'm going to say yes. I think I'm ready. Now that I know you forgive me for being stupid. She rolled up several tacos, putting one on a plate, and leaving the others. Walking to the table, she sat down and took a bite. Hey, these aren't bad. Not at all. Valerie watched her sister for a moment. I was worried I'd never see you smile again. I think marrying Ben will be the most brilliant thing you've ever done. Especially since you said he makes your heart beat faster. 
Ricky smiled at her sister's delicate phrasing. I'm definitely warm for his form. Valerie laughed. Maybe you can have half of those dozen kids I keep warning Jesse about. Half? Six would be an awful lot, don't you think? Maybe May can have three, and Amber can have three. Then each of us only need to have three, but there will still be a dozen kids running around. That's not a bad idea. I don't think Amber's in any hurry, though. Do you want to see her today? I told her you'd be here this week, and she said she could come by today while Nikki is in school and John is working. I'd love that. I want to write a little too, if that's okay. Valerie nodded. I'm sure that's fine. The horses are available for us to use when we're not filming. Bob rides quite a bit. I don't know if Ben rides or not, but if not, he can learn. Would you mind hooking up with Amber for lunch? And Ben and I can ride this afternoon? Works for me. I never thought of you as someone who would love riding, but I remember how cathartic it was for you after the kidnapping. Valerie got up and got herself another taco. These really are good. I need to make them more. There have to be fast food places that sell them around here. I think Whataburger does, but there isn't one in Wiggyville. I'd have to go to Weatherford, and it's easier to just make it myself than drive that far. Ricky shook her head. As long as you have your priorities straight. Jessie wandered out of the bedroom then, looking at the sisters for a minute before glaring at Ricky. You made her breakfast tacos. What is wrong with you? Ricky shrugged. I figured it would make her happy, and I was right. Don't you want a happy wife? Sure, I do, but I want less tacos in my world too. He took three and piled them on a plate, walking to the table. But as long as they're here, I shouldn't let them go to waste. Valerie shook her head. You gripe about them even as you're eating them. You should be thanking Ricky for the culinary delight she made for us. Next time I come down, I'll make colaches. Patience will teach me soon. She keeps promising. If you marry Ben, I don't think you'll get to visit real often, Valerie said with a frown. Jessie looked between the sisters. Wait, you're thinking of actually marrying him? He told me you'd talked about it, but I thought it was all in his head. I had no idea you were really considering it. Ricky shrugged. I love him. He makes me happy. I think I realized last night that it was time to say yes, when Valerie said that you couldn't imagine life without her. That's how I feel about Ben. He studied her for a minute, before nodding. I can't imagine a better reason to marry. I have a feeling he'll be asking again soon. Do you know something I don't? If I told you what I know, I'd be breaking the man code. Don't you know there are rules? Ricky sighed. I think I'll do the dishes then. It's got to be better than listening to man code explanations. Chapter 8 Ricky and Valerie spent the morning together, talking about the baby and everything else life had thrown at them. Do you ever resent Dad for taking off? Ricky asked. Valerie shrugged. He contacted me over the summer. He said he had been following my career. I decided not to see him. Did he ask about me? Ricky felt childish for asking, but she'd always missed growing up with a father. At least Valerie had seven years with him. She'd only had one. He asked how you were doing after the kidnapping. He'd read about it online. I didn't really answer, but I offered your phone number. I'm guessing he never called. Ricky shook her head, determined not to care. Enough had gone on since their father had left that his abandonment was the least of her worries. I wonder where the guys are today. I'm not sure, Valerie said, obviously happy with the change of topic. Jesse said something about doing an errand with Ben. He's going to pick up tacos and burgers on his way back from town, and they'll get here around noon. Amber is supposed to be here at 11. It'll be good to see her. I always feel like she's my sister too. 
She feels a connection to you as well. Valerie stood and wandered into the nursery. I haven't shown you the baby's room yet. The sisters spent the rest of the morning puttering around the baby's room. Valerie showed Ricky the things fans had sent them. We have enough handmade clothes for six babies, she said with a laugh. What are you really naming the baby? Ricky asked. I know you don't want it to get out, but it's not like I'm going to announce it on Twitter. And I am your favorite sister. Well, your favorite real sister. Amber's probably your favorite. Valerie rolled her eyes. We're naming him Jaron. Jaron Samuel Savoy. I like it. It's unusual, but not so far out there, no one will be able to pronounce it. There was a knock at the door, and then a voice called out, Honey, I'm home. Ricky rushed from the nursery into Amber's waiting arms. It's so good to see you. Amber held Ricky at arm's length for a moment. She hadn't seen her since the week following the kidnapping, and she seemed to be assessing her. You've lost some weight, but you look happy. I've been worried about you. I am happy. I still have nightmares. I still freak out over stupid things, but deep down, I think I'm happy. Wait, till you meet him. Amber took Ricky's hand and pulled her to the couch. Tell me everything about him. When the men walked in the door 45 minutes later, Amber looked at Ben. You'd better be who she thinks you are. Excuse me? Ben looked surprised at the vehemence behind the words. You'd better not hurt my friend. Ben looked back and forth, between Amber and Ricky. And you are? Amber Knight. I play Valerie's sister on Lazy Love, so as Ricky has pointed out more than once, we're practically sisters. Don't hurt her. I wouldn't. I love her. He said the words so simply that Ricky's heart skipped a beat. She stood and walked to him, wrapping her arms around his waist. I missed you this morning. He held her close. We had an errand. How can you have an errand when you live in another state? We brought lunch, he said, effectively changing the subject. Tacos for Valerie and me, and burgers for the rest of you. Ricky frowned at him. You're not going to tell me where you went. Jesse stepped in then. Did Valerie show you the baby's room? It looks to me like Mickey Mouse vomited in there. Ricky looked back and forth between the two men, but she didn't push it. I saw it. I like all the Mickey stuff. That baby is going to feel right at home when his Auntie Ricky takes him to Disney World. His Auntie Ricky isn't taking baby Amber anywhere without his Auntie Amber, Amber said. Jesse groaned. You all need to stop referring to my unborn son as Amber. You're making me crazy. Amber wrinkled her nose. I think Amber is a perfect name for a boy or a girl. And if you don't name this one Amber, I'll just hound you until you name the next one Amber. Amber is the name to remember. Amber. 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 She said the words in a hypnotic voice, as if trying to force Jessie to agree to naming the baby what she wanted. Oh please. We're not naming him Amber. Get a grip. He set the bag of food on the table and watched as his wife riffled through it, obviously desperate to get to her tacos. Amber looked at Jesse. How long has it been since you fed that poor baby tacos? She had them for dinner last night. Then she somehow conned Ricky into making her and made nachos. And Ricky made breakfast tacos this morning. My wife and baby are not starving for tacos. They all sat down and dug into the fast food. I'm going to have to work out for an extra hour, thanks to this burger, Amber lamented. But man, it tastes good. After lunch, Ricky stood up. I want to go riding. Will you come with me, Ben? Ben nodded. I'd love to. Have you ridden much? He shook his head. No, but I've ridden some. Mostly at camp where the horses plod along on their trails without much coaxing, but I can figure out what to do if I have to. 
Jesse stood up. I'll go with you, so they'll let you take the horses. He led them in the direction of the stable. Valerie's and my horses haven't been ridden as much this season, because of her pregnancy. If you wouldn't mind taking them out, they could use the exercise. I love Valerie's horse on the show. Her name is Buttercup, right? On the show, it is. In real life, it's Autumn. Oh, I like that. I'm riding Autumn then. Ben looked at Jesse. Is your horse gentle enough for a novice? Definitely. I couldn't ride when I got the part. I spent every spare minute with Trevor, and together, we figured it out. Your horse's name is Trevor? Okay, I'll take Trevor then. When they got to the stable, the man in charge offered to saddle the horses, and Ben didn't argue. We'll be back in an hour or two, he told Jesse. Be careful. If you break my sister-in-law, I'll have to deal with my wife. No one wants to deal with my wife. Ten minutes later, they were riding side by side toward the open meadow that separated the set from May's house. Once they reached the meadow, Ben pulled back on the reins and swung his right leg over the back of the horse, waiting as Ricky did the same. You're a better rider than you let on, she told him. He shrugged. Maybe I worked at the camp and taught others how to ride. Something like that. She shook her head, stepping toward him. I feel like we're constantly being watched here. I need less other people and more kissing. He grinned. I was thinking the same thing myself a little while ago. This ride was a brilliant idea. I thought so. Of course, it was mine, so I would think it was brilliant. He caught her by the waist and pulled her to him, his mouth descending for a more passionate kiss than they'd shared before. I want to ask you something. Her breath caught in her throat. Is he going to propose again? She knew just what she'd say if he did. What's that? He dropped to one knee, right there in the wet Texas grass. Ricky Dobson, will you do me the honor of being my wife? He held out a ring box to her, and opened it, so she could see the ring he'd chosen. Ricky took the ring and slipped it on her finger, nodding emphatically. I thought you'd never ask. I've asked and asked, he protested. Well, I thought you'd never ask properly. You know, on one knee in a field somewhere in Texas. Why did it need to be in a field somewhere in Texas? Ricky shrugged. I don't know, but this seems like the perfect setting, doesn't it? When do you want to get married? Wednesday, he asked. He knew he was pushing it, but he didn't want to wait. They'd be getting married in Culpeper after all, and Culpeper couples didn't have long engagements. Not even a week long usually. She bit her lip for a moment, thinking about the logistics of putting a small wedding together before Wednesday. Okay. Really? He couldn't believe he'd gotten her to agree to marry him so quickly, but he wasn't going to argue. He got to his feet, pulled her into his arms, and twirled her around. I can't believe you agreed. She smiled up at him, feeling as if the whole universe had opened up to give her everything she wanted. I love you. How could I keep putting it off? Ben looked down into her eyes. You really love me? She nodded, her eyes twinkling. Of course, I do. I don't marry just any guy on a moment's notice. He kissed her again, his hands pulling her close. I can't wait to have you as my wife. Ricky sighed. Me neither. No more saying goodnight at the door. We can hold each other all night long. It sounds heavenly. He kissed her once more. Should we go back and tell the others? Ricky shook her head. Not yet. Let's glory in it for another minute or two, and I'm going to call the bakery and get them started on a cake. The phone calls were fast and easy, and twenty minutes later, they were headed back to the set. They returned the horses and walked hand in hand back to Jesse and Valerie's trailer. 
When they opened the door, they found her sister and husband sitting on the couch side by side. Jesse's hand was on Valerie's belly. He's kicking, Valerie explained with a grin. Everyone in the world has felt him kick except for Jesse. As soon as Jesse gets close he stops moving. Jesse sighed. And he did it again. Someday that baby is going to let me feel him move. Probably after he's born, Valerie said with a smile. Can I feel him? Ricky asked, fascinated by the baby's growth. She loved the idea of having a baby with Ben. Valerie nodded. Sure. I'll show you where to put your hand. As soon as Ricky was close, Valerie took her hand and placed it on the side of her belly. Right there. Ricky smiled. I can feel him. He's strong. Does it hurt? Valerie shook her head. No, it feels strange, but it doesn't hurt at all. She looked down at the hand on her belly and squealed. I see an engagement ring. You're getting married. She pulled Ricky down awkwardly for a hug until Ricky was mostly lying across her. I'm going to squish you in amber. Ricky protested. Let me up. Valerie let go of her sister, but quickly got to her feet, hugging her again. Then she turned and hugged Ben, whispering to him, take good care of her when I'm not there to do it. Always. Whether you're there or not, he whispered back. She smiled. I knew there was a reason I liked you. Jesse stepped forward and shook Ben's hand. I told you that was the right size ring. Our ladies are the same size. Welcome to the family. Ben smiled at Jesse's words. Thank you. I'd say I got the pick of the litter, but I think we both got pretty special women. Oh, we definitely did. Asterisk. When Ricky and Ben walked into baggage claim back in Wyoming the following day, Grace squealed, running to hug Ricky. Another wedding. I have the cake done, and Corinne said to tell you she's been practicing her leaps for your wedding. Ricky looked at Ben. We have a flower girl all ready to go. Ben grinned at that. Brother Anthony said that we're turning into a ridiculously cliched town, and we need to stop this wedding madness, but that he'd be ready to marry us at seven tomorrow evening. Grace giggled. That sounds just like Brother Anthony. At least he's going to remember your name. I'm not sure he even knows mine, Ricky said. Maybe I should have it printed on my forehead for him. Grace shook her head. Do you have a dress yet? Do you want to wear mine? Ricky shrugged. I have a nice white suit that I thought would work well. I'm going to wear that. She wished Valerie could be there, but there was no way she could travel. Have you told Linda yet? Grace asked, pointing as the luggage started to come around the carousel. She obviously knew Ben would handle it, because she stayed where she was. Yeah, I called her. She cried. I don't know if it was because she was so happy I'm getting married or relieved that she's finally getting rid of her house guest. Grace laughed, watching as Ben hauled the luggage off the belt. Sorry Marcus couldn't come. He had a deposition. She turned and led the way to her SUV. Ricky looked at Ben. Have you emailed the parents to let them know there won't be a rehearsal tomorrow after all? Ben nodded. I did. I'm not leaving that to chance. Mrs. Pfaffenbach is concerned I'm taking my Christmas pageant duties too lightly, and that her Timmy might need a more experienced, dedicated director to bring out his true talent. Ricky giggled. Timmy Pfaffenbach was the worst actor of all the children, and he couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. He had been given the job of the third wise man, who had no lines at all. Well, you know Mrs. Pfaffenbach is always right about Timmy. Are you taking tomorrow off work too, Ricky? Grace asked as they got into the vehicle. Ricky shook her head. No, I'm not planning on it. If I could get off an hour or two early, that would help though. Are you getting married in the church? Or at Linda's? Grace asked. 
Ricky had no idea. I let Ben handle that. Ben grinned. I was happy to have something to do while they discussed all the other details of the wedding. We're getting married at Linda's. It's smaller and will be more private, and I think Ricky will feel more comfortable there. I will. Thank you. Ricky was constantly surprised at how thoughtful Ben was about her fears. She hadn't had a panic attack in over a week, and that was a record. She wanted to shout it from the rooftops, but she knew that no one would understand. Okay, so we're looking at how many guests? Grace asked. Ben answered for them. I was thinking about twenty. Will that be enough people to watch Corinne dance down the aisle? Oh, sure, Grace said. An audience of one or five thousand. That girl has the right attitude about it all. She's going to perform for whoever is willing to watch her. Ricky grinned. The girl had danced around the bakery enough that she knew Grace was telling the truth. What else do we need to do to get ready? Grace shrugged. I think you're set. You've got the pastor, a flower girl, and a preacher. What more do you need? A matron of honor might be nice. Would you be willing? Ricky asked. I'd love to. I still have the dress I wore for my twin's wedding, so I'll wear that. Sounds good to me. Ricky didn't care what anyone wore as long as they were decently covered. Are you going to live in town? Or at the ranch? Grace asked. We haven't really talked about it, Ricky said with a frown. She turned to Ben, who was in the back seat. I have a two-bedroom apartment over Jesse and Valerie's garage. It's more than big enough for both of us. Do you want to live there? Or your place? My place is no bigger than a postage stamp. It sounds like your place is the winner. Ricky smiled. I love my little apartment, but I've been afraid to live there without Jesse and Valerie. I won't be afraid if you're around. She was so thrilled that her fears were getting easier. She didn't know what she'd do without him. He was becoming her rock. Sounds good. I don't have a ton of stuff, but I'll pack up what I do have and get it moved over after the wedding. He loved saying the word wedding. When he used it, he thought of Ricky, and it felt like his heart was full. In just over 24 hours, she was going to be his wife, and he couldn't wait. Thanks for handling the wedding cake so fast, Ricky said. Grace laughed. You know I keep one mostly decorated in the freezer. I just had to add little pink roses, and I was done. Why pink? Ricky asked. I'm not sure. I look at you, and I think pink. She turned onto the highway that would take them into Culpeper. Did you remember to hug Valerie for me? I wouldn't forget. I even hugged Buttercup for you. She let you see Buttercup? Really? Grace's voice was full of envy. Ricky laughed, knowing that Grace was a huge fan of the show. It was how she'd gotten the job at the bakery. I even got to ride her. Okay, walk me through everything. Do you have pictures of yourself on the set? Ricky nodded. I'll show you when we get to Linda's. You're the best. Chapter 9 Ricky was in her room at Linda's house the following day, trying to get her breathing under control when Corinne danced her way into the room. I'm wearing my favorite flower girl dress. Corinne announced. The pink one used to be my favorite but it got too small, and then it didn't look good with my butterfly wings, so I had to get this one. It's lavender. Do you like lavender? Ricky smiled, thrilled for the diversion. I love lavender. You look beautiful, Corinne. I'm glad you found a dress that looks so good with your wings. Corinne did a little spin. That's how I go down the aisle. It's the only way I do it, so don't worry when I start spinning. Patience popped her head into the room, looking Ricky over. Do you need help getting ready? Ricky shook her head. I don't think so. How do I look? 
She stood up from the foot of the bed where she'd been sitting. She was wearing a white suit she'd found one day while shopping that she'd thought she might wear to church, but she'd realized how impractical white was and wondered why she'd ever purchased it. Patience studied her carefully. I think you need just a little more lipstick, because we all know Pastor Benjamin is going to smudge it. Because he's going to kiss her, isn't he, Mama? Yes, he is. It's part of the wedding ceremony. Ricky hurried to the mirror and put her lipstick on. Is he already out there? Yes, he's pacing back and forth. I think he's worried that you're going to get scared and run. Ricky laughed. The thought had occurred to me. If you ask me, and I know you didn't, you should run toward that man. You've been happier since you started dating him than I've ever seen you. He's really good for you. He is good for me. Ricky took a deep breath. I'm being silly. I'm in love with him, and he's just what I need in every way. Do you want me to go out and tell Brother Anthony it's time? Don't we need to wait until everyone gets here? Ricky asked, confused. Everyone's been here. We were supposed to get started 15 minutes ago. Ricky looked at the clock in surprise. I've been sitting back here ready for an hour, just staring at the wall. I should have checked on you sooner. I'm sorry. No, I should have come out. Ricky sighed. I'm not so good at this getting married thing. Nonsense. Brides are supposed to be late. Just not so late they freak their groom out, right? No one knew if we should come check on you, so we waited. That was our mistake. Corinne finally said it was her job as your flower girl. Patience shrugged. Grace probably should have done it as the matron of honor. I'm surprised Felicity didn't do it. She's pushier than the rest of you. Patience laughed. She's not pushy. She's just special. Mama. Corinne tugged on Patience's dress. Patience looked down at Corinne. Yes? People are waiting to see me dance down the aisle with my flowers. They sure are. I'll start the music. Patience hurried from the room, pulling Corinne along with her. Ricky took a deep breath and stepped out into the hall. She would be the center of attention, which was hard, but she'd be married to Ben when it was done, and that was so worth it. She heard music start, and then there was soft laughter. Grace hurried toward her. I'm sorry. I didn't know you were ready. I should have checked on you. Ricky grabbed Grace in a hug, kissing her cheek. Thank you for being here for me. I should have let you know when I was ready. We're good? Of course, we're good. Ricky gave her friend a nudge. And you're up. Grace grinned and walked down the hall to the living room where the wedding was taking place. Ricky watched her go and waited a minute before following. As she walked, she felt the panic rise up within her, and after she turned the corner to walk into the living room, it became almost overwhelming. And then she saw Ben standing in front of Brother Anthony, his eyes filled with love. She walked to him and stood beside him, not looking at anyone else. If she could just concentrate on him, she could get through it. Brother Anthony gave a small cough to clear his throat, before beginning. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to join this man and this woman in holy matrimony. Now I know we're all happy for them that they've decided to tie the knot and all, but I have to make it clear how I feel about all these fast weddings in Culpeper. There's only been one long engagement since those Quinlan women showed up in town and turned it on its ear. And that engagement was barely enough time to let the ink dry on the marriage license. I ask you, what is in the water that two people can't give a pastor enough time to think about what he's going to say at a wedding after they get engaged? There is something wrong with this town, and it's a mighty wrong. We must fix this trend and return to a normal place, where people can wait three days after they get engaged to get married. Ricky looked at the amused look on Ben's face and did her best not to giggle. Brides weren't supposed to giggle in the middle of their wedding ceremonies, were they? 
Brother Anthony looked out at the small crowd of people gathered there for the wedding. Now, lovey. I know what you're going to say. This isn't the time or place, but you always tell me it isn't the time or place. You never give me my soapbox to stand on, but this time, I'm just taking it. You hear me? I hear ya, Tony. I guess this is as good a time as any since it's your assistant pastor up there getting married, and he can't very well run away from you. All right then, now that I've said my piece, let's get you two hitched. Ben, do you promise to love, honor, and cherish your bride? Till death do you part? In sickness and health and all the other stuff you go through when you're married? Ben looked down into Ricky's eyes, stroking her cheek with one hand. I do. And do you, the young lady with a man's name, do you take this man to be your husband? Love, honoring, and respecting him through sickness and health, rich and poor forever and ever amen? Ricky nodded before she answered. I do. I really, really do. Then I now pronounce you man and wife. Go ahead and kiss her so we can all watch and stuff. Ben pulled her to him by the hand he held, lowering his head to kiss her softly. I was afraid you'd run. I am kind of a flight risk, but I can't imagine not marrying you, so where would I go? He hugged her tightly, and then they turned to face everyone. He felt Ricky shudder beside him, and he slipped his arm around her waist. I'm here, and you're going to be fine, he whispered softly. I am. I really am. Felicity, who had been FaceTiming the whole thing with Valerie, wiped away a tear. They're married, she squealed. Ricky looked at Ben, still needing to keep her eyes on him and not on the people watching her. I think people are happy for us. I know I am, he said with a grin. Linda stood up then. Okay, we're going to have some cake and then we're going to kick these newlyweds out of my house. I think Ricky needs to be able to get out of here before we all make her as crazy as we are. Ben led Ricky over to the cake, which was on the counter, separating the kitchen from the dining area. We can cut the cake and go. Perfect, she whispered. I have all my stuff packed. Together, they cut the cake and fed each other a bite. Brother Anthony stood watching them. Good job getting it into each other's mouths. That whole smearing the cake all over each other's faces is just plain silly. Ben nodded. It is silly. And now we're running away from here. What's your hurry? Stay a while. Brother Anthony smiled, his eyes dancing with laughter. I needed to talk to you about Sunday's sermon anyway. Ben groaned inwardly. Tomorrow. I'm getting my bride out of here. He knew Ricky wouldn't do well if asked to stay there much longer. Too many people were watching them, and it wasn't good for her at all. He took her hand and led her toward the hallway, knowing her things would be there. Let's go. She smiled. Are we leaving in one car or both? He groaned. Hadn't thought about that. Why don't we take your car? and you can drop me off here on your way to work in the morning. I'm assuming you need to work. Yeah, I do. I've taken too much time off this week already. She opened the door to her room, and he grabbed two suitcases. Does this have everything you need for tonight? We can get the rest of your stuff when no one is around. She grabbed a shoulder bag. That's the bag I need. Let's take all three. He nodded, not caring how much she wanted to take as long as she had what she needed. We're heading to your apartment at Valerie's? Yes, please. Did you pack clothes? Of course, I did. I didn't want to have to run home after the wedding to get them. He let her precede him out of the room and stopped almost immediately as she hugged Linda, who was waiting for them. Thank you for letting me stay here and being my surrogate mom for a while. I don't know what I would have done without you. You're stronger than you think you are. You'd have done fine without me. Linda swiped a tear from her eye. I'm proud of you. You've grown so much, and Ben is the right man for you. 
Be happy. Ricky sniffled as she wiped her own tear away. It's not like I won't be around anymore. I'll still come see you. But it won't be the same, and you know it. It hasn't been the same since you started seeing Ben. You've been busier and more involved with life. And that's so very good for you. With one last hug, Linda smiled. Now go and be happy. I will. Ricky looked over Linda's shoulder to see Roy standing there listening. She walked to the older man and hugged him. Your turn next. Roy grinned. We'll see. Ricky hurried toward the door, hoping no one else would try to stop them. She appreciated that everyone had come to her wedding, but she couldn't deal with that many people, so she needed to get out and soon. She rushed out to the car, feeling the cold wind biting against her skin. Why didn't I bring a coat? I have everything in the world but a coat. Too late. I'm not going back into that house with all those people for all the tea in China. She got into the car and started it, turning the heat on high and feeling the cold blast of air. Shivering, she rubbed her arms. Ben got into the passenger seat, noticed her shivering, and immediately got out and took off his suit jacket, handing it to her. Do you want me to go back in for your coat? She shook her head adamantly. If you go back in, people will think they can come out and talk to me, and that's the last thing I want. I need to get away. Put my jacket on then, and you'll warm up a little. She slipped her arms into the sleeves and was amazed at how dwarfed she felt. She was struck again at how huge Ben was compared to her. Thank you. She loved to feel the warmth from his skin and smell him on the coat. Okay, off to Ricky's place. As she drove, she explained about the garage apartment. Valerie and Jesse bought this place, and immediately started building the apartment for me. They wanted me to have a safe haven if I ever decided I couldn't stand being in Iowa, and they knew I was close. So, when Valerie talked me into moving here, which didn't take long, I had this beautiful, brand new apartment. I only stayed there for a few weeks, because I wasn't comfortable being there without Jesse and Valerie. I heard all these weird noises and freaked out regularly. So, Felicity invited me to move in with Linda, and I've been there ever since. I've gone back to Valerie's whenever she and Jesse were in town, but that was the only time. I'm excited to see it. You've said great things about it. He frowned for a moment. You know that on a pastor's salary, we'll never really see the kind of wealth your sister has. Ricky laughed. I wouldn't know what to do with the kind of money she has. You really don't mind? Not at all. If I want money, I can find a way to earn it. Maybe I'll go back to school. Really? Are you thinking about that? Ricky shrugged. I never intended to drop out. I could finish my undergrad with online courses. I don't know though. I kind of like working at the bakery. Would it bother you if I went back to school? Or if I didn't? I don't love you for your education or lack thereof. I love you for who you are. I don't care what you do for a living. What about kids? He looked over at her. What about them? Do you want them? Not tomorrow, but sure, eventually they'd be nice. She nodded. Valerie said we need to have six, but I talked her down to three. Is it okay if I don't even ask? Sure. She pulled into the driveway of the freestanding apartment on their land. The bottom floor was a two-car garage, and the upper was her place. As she pulled up, she realized her nerves were about to get the better of her, so she stayed sitting in the car for a moment after turning off the engine. I haven't been here in a couple of weeks, so you'll have to forgive the dust and lack of food. He shrugged. Dusting is easy, and we'll eat breakfast at the bakery. I'll try to make time to stop after work to get some groceries. Just make a list, and I'll do it. It's easier for me, since I'll be in town anyway. He took her hand, lacing his fingers through hers. 
I'm not going to judge you on your homemaking skills or lack thereof. She smiled at that, turning to him. I can't believe I found a man who puts up with me like you do. Puts up with you? I beg to be with you. He opened his door. I'll carry your suitcases up. Thanks. She grabbed her shoulder bag from the back seat, carrying it up the stairs. Once she'd unlocked the door, she stepped inside, smiling when she saw all of her pretty things. The apartment was decorated perfectly in her eyes, and she was thrilled she now got to live there full time. When she heard Ben's footsteps behind her, her heart started beating faster, almost painfully in her chest. Her breathing accelerated until she was taking short breaths and not getting enough air. She leaned against the wall, recognizing all the symptoms for exactly what they were. She was having a panic attack on her wedding night. Who did that? She moved to the couch, leaning forward with her forearms against her thighs, trying to slow her breathing. Why had she thought she could go through with a wedding night? She knew better. She was a mess, and he should get their marriage annulled before it was too late. She looked at him and shook her head, tears coursing down her cheeks. I can't. I thought I could, but I just can't. I'm so sorry. Chapter 10 Ben stared at her, trying to comprehend what was happening with Ricky. What couldn't she do? He walked over to sit beside her on the couch and wrapped an arm around her shoulders. Tell me what's wrong. What can't you do? She shook her head. I can't go through with the wedding night. I thought I could, but I'm so sorry. I just can't. Ben looked at her for a moment, closing his eyes as he dealt with her words. That's all right. It is? She looked at him as if he'd lost his mind. It is. I knew it was a possibility when I married you. I hoped you'd find that you weren't frightened, but I'm not even surprised. You're not? She was, and she realized she shouldn't have been. New situations were hard for her, and even though this was Ben, she couldn't go through with it. Not yet. Do you want to get an annulment? Of course not. I married you because I love you. Yes, I eventually want sex. I want it tonight. I'm a red-blooded male, after all. But I'm not going to insist when I know it will cause you anxiety. We'll wait. Are you real? He laughed. Sure, I'm real. Don't think I don't hate this, because I do. I just understand. We'll spend some time getting to know each other, and then you'll be able to make love. I hope. I will. I know I will. Time is what I need. Then time is what you'll get. He kissed the top of her head, and sighed. I'm going to sit right here while you get ready for bed. Wear something that's not revealing please. You're still planning to sleep with me, she asked, surprised. He nodded. Unless you have a spare room you'd rather I was in. I have one, but there's no bed. She thought about it for a moment, before nodding. Okay. We're adults. I've been looking forward to sleeping in your arms for too long to tell you that you have to sleep on the couch. He laughed. I wouldn't agree to that anyway. This couch is way too short for me. I'd take the floor over the couch. She got to her feet. I'm going to go wash my face, brush my teeth, and get in bed. I'll let you know when I'm done in the bathroom, and you can come in. She rushed through her nightly routine, and when she left the bathroom to get into bed, she called out to him before sliding under the covers. She lay on her side as she heard him come into the bedroom and then close the bathroom door. When he came out of the bathroom, he was wearing a pair of sweatpants and a t-shirt. This is the best I can do. I don't own pajamas. She looked over at him and smiled. That's perfect. She was wearing a pair of pink pajamas with panda bears on them, and she felt a little silly, because who wore that on her wedding night, but he didn't complain. He came to the bed and slid in beside her, his arm pulling her close to him. 
If I do something that scares you, let me know. I just want to hold you. Ricky sighed. I know that's a lie. Okay, I want more than that, but that's all I'm going to do tonight. Even if you beg me on one knee to tear your clothes off and ravish your body, I'm going to just hold you. She giggled. Sounds good. She rested her head on his shoulder, and he stroked her back softly through her pajamas. It felt good to be so close to him. What did you think of Brother Anthony's tirade during the wedding? He laughed. It was very Brother Anthony. The man is crazy. He stroked her hair away from her face, loving that she was lying there and just letting him touch her. Trust had to come first, and eventually, they'd make love. It didn't have to happen tonight though, as much as he wished it could. Why don't you shut the light off? Ricky rolled away from him to turn off the lamp on her nightstand, before returning to rest with her head on his shoulder. This is nice. He smiled and kissed the top of her head. I couldn't agree more. I'm going to enjoy sleeping with you as much as I'll enjoy making love with you. Are you sure about that? Ben laughed. Okay, almost as much. Asterisk. Their first rehearsal was Friday night, because they'd had to cancel on Wednesday, and Lovey had insisted the two of them needed another night alone before they would be ready to direct the children. After work on Friday, Ricky headed into town to help out with the pageant. She couldn't believe just how sweet and gentle Ben was with her, even though they'd yet to make love. He'd done the grocery shopping, as promised, and had praised her cooking. In bed, he held her close, but did no more than stroke her over her clothes. She felt guilty that she hadn't been able to make love with him, but she was getting more comfortable every day. She worked with some of the children on their singing, while he worked with others on the play. Together, they'd be able to get the whole thing done. The nativity would be the easiest part, because the children didn't really need to act for it. He followed her home from the rehearsal, in good spirits. He could tell she was getting more and more comfortable with him. He truly hadn't been surprised when she'd refused to make love with him, disappointed yes, but not surprised. He gave her a few minutes to get ready for bed as usual, and when she called to let him know it was his turn in the bathroom, he changed into the sweats and t-shirt he'd been sleeping in. When he came out, he saw that she was bundled under the covers, completely. He slid into bed and reached for her as he always did, but was surprised when he encountered more skin than usual. He wanted to tell her to go put on more clothes, but he couldn't do that to her. He could make it through the night with her half-clothed if she could. He pulled her to him, his hand stroking over the silky thing she was wearing, wanting to reach down and see how much of her it covered, but he didn't dare. He didn't want to scare her. How'd the singing go? He asked. Pretty well. I think our two soloists are going to kill it. I'm not sure about the others killing anything, but the ears of the audience. She pressed a kiss to his shoulder. What about the play? He shrugged. The kids were good. They did what they were told and they did it well. There was a small fight between two of the boys because they both thought they should be standing closer to the audience because their mothers had told them they should be seen. I took care of it. How? I put them both behind another boy who wasn't fighting. Good solution. She stared at him in the darkness, wondering why he wasn't making a move. She'd worn her sexy nightgown she'd bought for their wedding night. Couldn't he tell that was a sign that he should initiate lovemaking with her? I was pretty proud of it. He stroked his hand up her bare arm, wishing she wasn't so frightened. Lying in bed with her with so few clothes on wasn't going to be easy. I like this thing you're wearing. Is it new? It is. I got it for our wedding night. So, that's why it's so sexy. I wish you'd been able to wear it. I would have loved to see you in it. Oh really? So, you don't think you'd have wanted to take it off me? She felt like she was having to lead him around by the nose to get him to understand she was ready. What was he waiting for? 
Is that an invitation? Could she really be saying what he thought she was saying? Or was it just wishful thinking? I thought I was going to have to run out tomorrow and have one engraved to send you for you to figure it out. She shook her head at him, laughter in her voice. Are you sure? He asked, propping himself on one elbow and looking at her. You know you can stop me any time. Just kiss me. She reached out and wrapped her arms around his neck, taking care of the kissing part herself. She pressed her mouth to his, her tongue stroking his top lip. Ben didn't need to be told twice. His hands began stroking her insistently, one of them going under the hem of the flimsy little thing she was wearing. He still didn't know what it was called, but at the moment, he didn't care much either. He stroked her hip, while his other hand cupped her breast, his thumb finding her nipple and bringing it to a peak. Ricky moved closer to him, one of her legs thrown over both of his. I love you, she said softly, needing him to hear the words. I love you so much. Don't feel like you have to do this. He wanted her desperately, but he didn't want her to feel forced into making love with him. He continued stroking her, his hands belying his words. I don't feel forced into anything. You made it very clear that you'd still love me whether I was able to make love with you or not. That's all I really needed from you. Good. There was no more talk for a long time after that, both of them too busy to think about words. Afterward, they lay snuggled together on the bed, her head pillowed on his shoulder as it had been the past two nights, but tonight, she felt a contentment that surprised her. I could do that again, she said with a grin. He laughed. I hope so, because I have a feeling once is not going to be enough for me. She pressed a kiss to his bare shoulder, surprised at how comfortable she felt being completely naked with him. Thank you for making me feel so loved. I don't think you have any idea what you've done for me, and thank you will never feel adequate to express my appreciation. He sighed. I don't want you to thank me. I just want you to be happy. You mean so much to me. She sighed, contentedly. Who would have thought I'd find love with an associate pastor in Culpeper, Wyoming? I still can't get over it. Hey, pastors can make love too. She smiled, closing her eyes. They sure can. So happy you figured out you could do this. I worried that I'd be missing out forever. Epilogue Ricky sat in the front row of the church beside Ben, waiting for the children to file in for the pageant. It was Christmas Eve, the night they'd all been waiting for. The music started, and Corinne led the others onto the stage, leaping and twirling as she went. Ricky had fought with her for a while over the butterfly wings, but she'd finally given in. After all, what was a Christmas pageant without butterfly wings on the ballerina? Most of the children did well, but as Linda had said, there were a few that just couldn't seem to get with the program. Little Timmy Pfaffenbach decided to say the other wise men's lines, because he didn't have any of his own. Little Georgie Bob Allen decided to do an impromptu song, and his voice wasn't bad, but he didn't sing a Christmas song. In fact, Bubba Shot the Jukebox didn't seem to be a song that should be sung in church at all in Ricky's opinion but he got too many cheers for them to stop him. And when Molly Dickens started cartwheeling across the stage, Ricky could only laugh helplessly. After the performance, the parents all said what a delight it was that they'd strayed so far from the traditional program the church did every year, and all Ben could do was nod. He hadn't intended to stray from the program at all. It was as if the children had been rehearsing a different pageant than he'd been directing, but it was a hit. Maybe they'd have to do it all the same way next year. After all, nothing seemed to go according to plan in their Culpeper Christmas, but it went the way it was obviously supposed to. Ricky had not only broken out of her shell, she had not had a panic attack since her wedding night, even though she was around people a lot more than she had been. Life was exciting enough without that. She smiled up at Ben, thrilled to have him beside her. Life was good, 